So like I said, my name is Jake, and uh, because a lot of our pastors are out today, um, they asked if I could teach, and um, unfortunately, you got me to, to lead today. But I'm excited because I get to teach on a passage that at first I, I wasn't really sure, but as I del del uh, dug into it, I got to really understand uh, what God was saying, and, and it's a lot more exciting to me than it was when I started working on this. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get started. So Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Lord, that you have given us a way, Lord, that is not through our powers, not through our works, but through yours. And I just pray that as I teach, Lord, you would give me the words to say that we would all understand more uh, your word and that your spirit would be moving today. I keep all the pastors safe as they're out. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we are continuing on in our teaching in Galatians. We're part nine. We still have a, another chapter to go after today, but um, I will be going through the, the last part of chapter four. Uh, the first half of chapter four that Ray talked about last week, um, I just wanted to quickly summarize his main points. So the first one is, don't look back, there's nothing there. Now, this is a pretty big topic because that follows into today. But now that we're saved, now that we have Christ, why do we want to go back to the law? Why do we want to go back to a life without God's grace? And so that, that was a question Paul asked the Jews and uh, the early church, and especially the Judaizers, those who are coming in. Another point is, and I think this was a really big challenge is follow Christ in such a way others will want to follow him, right? Paul said to follow him as he follows Christ. And Ray asked the question, is, is your life worth imitating? And that was, that was a pretty big challenge to me because I can tell you I don't always live a life that others should live. I, I know how sinful I am. The third point was uh, that we shouldn't let anything steal our zeal, right? We shouldn't let anything from comforts to hardships to anything in this world to take away our passion for Christ, because that is so much greater than anything that we can experience. And finally, is Christ being formed in you? If you know Christ, is he building into you daily? Are you becoming more like his son? And if you don't know Christ, are you letting him work in you? Are you understanding your need for salvation? So with that summary of last week, we'll jump into this week and verse 21, where it says, tell me, where Paul is talking, and I think he's talking to the Judaizers primarily, and he says, tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Right? So Paul is talking to people who have been raised hearing about the Old Testament, hearing the law, and he's asking them, do they fully understand what it says? Right? Have, in a sense, have they read the terms and conditions? Have they read the fine print? Because a lot of people will see the do's and don'ts of the Old Testament and hold to that, right? That, that's what the Judaizers were telling the early church, is yes, you have Christ, but there's a bunch of do's and don'ts. And that's the way you're holy, is you follow these do's and don'ts. And Paul, someone who has zealously studied the old scriptures, he knew what those were pointing to. He understood in light of Christ, what was the point of all those do's and don'ts? And so Paul here goes back to kind of the beginning of Israel, and he starts talking about a story of Abraham. And in Galatians uh, 4.22, he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one of the servant woman and one of the free woman. We, I don't think we can understand how well the Jews understand the Old Testament, right? That's something that they were taught early in life. They were repeatedly taught. And so Paul goes back to the very beginning. He goes back to the patriarch of the Jewish faith and actually a couple other faiths. Abraham was incredibly important because God gave Abraham a promise, right? He used Abraham's line to establish the nation of Israel and to have the line of where Christ comes from. So Abraham was foundational. And if you know the story, that he has two sons. We'll get into that in a bit later. But the thing I wanted to start with is why was Abraham important? And he was important because of the promise that God gave him. 
That promise is given all the way back in Genesis chapter 17. And it says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. And no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Right away, I think we want to make sure we understand what God is saying here, right? A lot of times we can think that Jesus was kind of a new idea started in the first century. We can think of the Old and New Testaments as separate books. I mean, there is a big time gap between them, but they're separate things. But Paul here is going back, and he's mentioning Abraham and the promise, because that is what we are believing in now. God said Abraham would be the father of a multitude of nations, not just a great nation. And so right from the beginning, God wanted to show that he wanted all people to come to him, not just the Jews, not just a select group, but everyone. However, God did want to use a select group because that was going to be something, uh, a symbol, an allegory um, that God used later. And so we can see in the Old Testament a lot of things pointing forward. The Old Testament has a lot of references, a lot of things that we can see that are fulfilled in the New Testament, especially Christ. A lot of these things are pointing to Christ. Jesus is a continuation and uh, an increase or an improvement on the things in the Old Testament. We can look at Melchizedek. That's someone that Abraham actually tithed to, so someone that in a way Abraham was under. And Melchizedek was a king and a priest, something that the Israelites never had. Their, their Levites and their kings were separate. Those were separate roles to be fulfilled. But here we have before them a priest and a king, and he is mentioned in Hebrews as kind of a, a reference to Jesus, because Jesus is the high king and the high priest. We have other examples of references in the Old Testament with later in the story of Isaac and Abraham, with the, when Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac, God provides a, a substitute. He provides the goat or the ram so that Abraham can sacrifice that instead of his son. God provides a substitute, and this is just an example of that substitute. And the last is the whole sacrificial laws in Leviticus. These are pointing to the fact that the Jews had sin, that they were going to continually be sin, that there needed to be some substitute, but also that, that the things on this earth are not good enough. Animals would only cover them for a year or a week or until the next time they sinned. But Christ is, a, you know, the escalation of this because Christ covers our sins forever. So there's, there's many more references, and we'll get into a couple more later, but I just want you guys to keep in mind that the Old Testament is pointing towards Christ, and there's a bunch of things that we can see pointing towards that. So we'll jump back to Galatians and see how is Paul going to use this story. And in chapter, or verse 23, he says, But the son of the servant woman has been born according to the flesh, while the son of the fr free woman through the promise— Again, Paul, uh, Paul is talking towards the story of Ishmael and Isaac. And this is a pretty difficult story to read uh, because of what happens, but I think it's an important one. So we're going to jump to Genesis 17 again and read just a snippet of that story. And so it says, Then God said to Abraham, he, As for Sarah, your wife... You shall not call her name Sarah, Sarai, but Sarah, and her name will be her name, and I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless him, bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a son be born of a man one hundred years old? And will Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a son? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might uh, live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah your wife will bear your son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. And he will be an everlasting covenant for his seed. Apologize. 
after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and he will make him, a, make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish Isaac, who Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So right away, we're looking at the separation between what Abraham thought God wanted and what God actually wanted, right? There was the man's way and God's way. So in the story, right, in Abraham's life, he was told by God, you'll be a father of many nations. And he said, well, the only way I know how to be a father is through the biological course, and my wife is too old. We haven't had a kid. There's got to be another way. So him and his wife concocted a plan that he would sleep with his, her servant, uh, Hagar, and she conceived a son, Ishmael. Now, this is God's plan, and unfortunately, or this was man's plan, and unfortunately, man's plan leads to a lot of problems, right? This led to a lot of hurt, both immediately and long-term. This was limited. Abraham was relying only on what he understood for biology, only what he understood for what, how life works, and so was limited to his own knowledge. And like I said, it hurt people then, and it is still hurting people today. There's uh, the accepted belief in Islam is that Ishmael was the original son. He was the one who inherited the blessing from Abraham. And so we can see that there would be enmity between the sons, and I think that still follows today, at least spiritually. Uh, we don't need to get into the debate about genealogies there, but I think spiritually we can see there's been hurt through because of this. However, God's plan was different. God's plan was that Sarah, a woman who was very old, would bear a son. They didn't believe that that was possible. Sarah laughed. Abraham laughed. And God said, no, this is going to be how it is, right? And against all their understanding, she conceived a son. Now, this was done in love, right? The original method, the, the, God, the man's method, relied on breaking of a covenant vow of marriage. It relied on hurting others. But God's way was done through marriage, was through love, was through a blessing of someone who hadn't been blessed and now is being blessed in Sarah and Abraham. Second of all, like I already said, it happened because through supernatural means, right? This is, again, one of those references that we can look for Christ. Isaac was born through supernatural means. Jesus was born through supernatural means. Even John the Baptist was born through uh, unexpected supernatural means because God wanted to show, here's what I've done in the past and here's how I'm continuing it today, but I'm escalating it, right? Jesus was born of a virgin. Isaac was born of uh, very old parents. And finally, right, the hurt that we see because of Ishmael and Hagar we don't see with Isaac, right? That is the path where we see Christ. We see peace coming to earth for all nations through this promise. So God's ways is much better. All right. So that is some history, some reminders of how God points to things in the Old Testament pointing forward. We're going to go to the New Testament and see how Paul is using those references. So in Galatians 4.24, it says, this is spoken with allegory. For these women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, bearing children into slavery. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. And for she is in slavery with her children. Now, there's a couple locations here that are being used as allegory or analogies. Uh, he mentions Mount Sinai. He mentions... Arabia, and he mentions the present Jerusalem. Those are all important locations for the Israelite people because they all have uh, both real life significance and also spiritual significance in how they're referenced. So what do these places mean? First, I wanted to talk about Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, you know, the city of peace. That is where God's temple is. That's where God lives. In the Old Testament, that was God's holy place. It was the Holy of Holies was in the temple in Jerusalem. And so, at, you know, kind of a macro scale, Jerusalem was the Holy of Holies for Israel. That was just the kind of the analogy that was in the people's mind. That's where God lived. Now, we also see that 
Israel, the nation of Israel, the physical land, that was where God's people were. That's where God's holiness was reigning. So that was the holy place. And outside of that was Arabia. Outside of Israel was the surrounding nations. And that was the temple court. That was where the people who were not clean could come and be cleaned before they came to God's presence. So all of these are pointing important places and pointing towards the story of Christ. And the final one I wanted to talk about is Mount Sinai. This is very important because this is where Moses received the law. It's where he goes on the mountain, comes down, sees the Israelites sinning, has to go back up, get the commandments again, and comes down. Right? This is where God gives us the law. Now, if you look physically, where is that? That's not in the holy place. It's not in the holy of holies. It's in Arabia. That, the law was given before Israel. That was given before God's place on earth came. So this is just kind of these references, inter, um, interlacing references, where God's saying, look, the law I gave to you was good, but that is not my promise, right? It's not Jerusalem wasn't in Mount Sinai. Jerusalem is, you know, in Israel, and that's where my place is. And so we get to actually look at what this is all compared against. Well, first, I do want to stop, and my first main point is just a reminder that since Hagar was uh, born of human means, she was representing Mount Sinai, the law, in this analogy, we have to remember that the law does not bring us into communion with Christ. You know, Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteousness is like dirty garments. And all of us like a leaf, wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind carry us away. In our own works, we are not good enough to bring us to God. The law that was given isn't good enough to bring us to God, right? That was something pointing us forward. And so we need to remember that Hagar is the example of human methods of the law of us trying to work our way to God and that not being possible. So we'll go back to Galatians and see what Sarah and Isaac represent. And in verse 26, it says, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother for it is written, rejoice barren woman who does not give birth, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more numerous are the children of the desolate one than the one who has a husband. So God's saying, Jerusalem, which was my sign of heaven on earth, is not as good as actual heaven, right? It's not as good as where God actually lives and where God wants us is the future, or the Jerusalem from above, Eden, heaven. That is the example of us with Christ, right? God wants us in communion with him. And if we rely on the Old Testament, if we rely on the law, that's not good enough because that's not his promise. His promise was a Messiah. Now, I do want to make sure that we're always connecting these references, and whenever it is said, it is written, we have to remember, well, that's going to be a reference to the Old Testament. So what is Paul referencing there? And he's referencing Isaiah 54. Now, I want to give some context before we read this. The, the latter half of Isaiah is written to the Jews as they are returned from exile. The beginning half is written to them saying, you're going to suffer. You have sinned against God. Here's hope, but your path is leading you towards exile. Then there's the exile. Later, the, the later part, God is saying, now that you've returned from exile, here's the hope. I want you to go share my truth to all the nations, but you're not good at it, right? He, he talks about how the Jews complain. They don't share God's news. And so he instead will send a Messiah. He sends a suffering servant. And in chapter 53 of Isaiah, it talks about how God would send someone to suffer, to die for us. He would take our punishment. And after he dies, he would be rewarded with an inheritance of that world. And because of this Messiah who comes and dies and is alive again, we get to rejoice. And so in chapter 54, it says, Shout for joy, O barren woman who has not given birth. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud. You who have not been in labor, for more numerous are the sons of the 
the desolate one than the sons of the married woman, says Yahweh. So God here is saying, my people are not going to be biologically driven. They're not going to be just the Jews who are physically in Israel, but they're going to be all the nations. God's going to be giving women who, in this analogy, women who have not had children, children. How would he do that, right? He did it through Sarah, through a miraculous birth. But I think here he's talking about how our spiritual children are, you know, the nations, are those who have accepted Christ because we've shared with them. Paul talks about this when he says, my children. He's talking about people who he's not physically related to, but spiritually related to. And so God, I think Paul here is referencing this when he talks about that. He's talking about how our offspring, in a sense, are the people that we share the Christ with, who have accepted salvation because they get to know who Christ really is. So given that the offspring of who God really wants is people who have accepted him, Paul says this in chapter 20, or verse 28, and you brothers, in accordance with Isaac, are children of the promise. He's calling the Christians that they are connected to Isaac because they are given through a promise, through supernatural means, not through human means, not through the work that they did, but through Christ. And so even us today are brothers with Isaac because we are children of the promise. So that leads me to the second main point, which is the promise is based on God's effort. Christ suffered for our sins. He suffered in our place because we can't do it on our own. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, so that no one can boast. I probably didn't quote it the way it's read up there, but that's the way I learned it, so I'm going to just memorize it that way. So we, we get to remember that God did this for us. God's work is the one that saves us, not our own work. So in light of that, Paul does issue a warning. So in Galatians Uh, 429, he says, But at that time, he who was born according to the flesh was persecuting him who was born according to the Spirit. So also now, but what does the Scripture say? Cast out the servant woman and her son. For the son of the servant woman shall not be uh, an heir with the son of the free woman. So Paul's talking to the Judaizers here, and he's saying, look, if you're not sons of the promise, if you're sons of the law and God and, and the man's way of doing things, trusting in, in the, co- the old covenant, you are not going to be with God. You're not going to be in the promised land of the future or the Jerusalem that is above. Because just as Ishmael and, and Hagar were cast out because they didn't have an inheritance with Isaac, those who haven't accepted Christ will be cast out because they don't have an inheritance with Christ. So this is a a pretty dire warning. And again, this is a reference. So um, that is going back to Galatians or Genesis. And if you want to read it, it basically is saying where Sarah cast out Hagar. So with this in mind, moving to the next verse, what then? So then, brothers, we are not children of a servant woman, but the free woman. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, stand and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Right? So now we are are children of the promise. We have been given freedom. We don't have to do it on our own. God will do it for us. So why are we going back? Why are they going back to this work, this effort, this struggle and burdens that they don't have to take? That is a sinful mentality because it is a a pride. It's saying, I can do this on my own. I'm the one who has to work. How will God love me if I'm not doing the right things? But that's not how God works. God loves us despite us doing the wrong things. God loves everyone. There's no one that he doesn't want to draw to himself. But God also will honor our choice. So, my final point here is do not go back to the slavery of the law. Just like Ray said, why turn back? Why do we want to go back to the slavery of the law when we have freedom? Peter, I think, echoes this word, and he says, as obedient children, not being conformed 
to the former lust when you were in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your conduct, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God made us holy, and so that's why we do good works. We're not trying to do good works to become holy. God, God's way is not burdensome. We're not working and hoping that God is happy with what we did. We're happy because God has done something great in us, and we get to rejoice in that. So uh, that's all I had today. I wanted to quickly summarize the main points, and that is the law does not bring us into communion with God. The promise is not based on God, uh, the promise is based on God's efforts. And finally, don't go back to the slavery of the law. So as we go through, the, go out this week, remember, we are not working our own salvation. We are not trying to impress God. We're not trying to undo the problems that we've caused, the sin we've done by our works. We're not trying to show God, I'm good enough. Because God has said, despite you not being good enough, I love you. And I'm going to make a way. I'm going to do something supernatural. So I'm going to close in prayer, and then we'll sing another song. Lord, I just thank you for today. Thank you that you have given us a better way. Lord, you have given us a way that we can't do on our own because, Lord, you are perfect and you require perfection. And despite that, Lord, you love us and you have given us a path towards your Son. And Lord, just thank you. I pray that we would go out today with the knowledge and the joy that, Lord, you have given us freedom from all the work that we tried to do, and you have given us uh, salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.